Hello and welcome to the Will Leach Show. I am the aforementioned Will Leach, and I thank you for spending part of your day with me. Today's show is about access and proximity. Today's guest, David Cohn, grew up wanting to be a newspaper sports writer. Now, it turns out David Cohn had an advantage that most kids who grew up wanting to be sports writers didn't have. He was good at sports and ended up being a Major League Baseball player, a pretty great one, all told. He went from someone who wanted to write about sports to someone who actually gets to play them, and that is always the greatest thing to be. It's always important to remember when you read about sports or watch people talking about sports that they would always, always rather be playing sports. Whether it's someone who never had talent or someone who used to play but got too old to keep playing, they always wish they could still be out there. Now, typing about sports is literally the only thing in the world I have ever been any good at. But if you told me I could trade my entire life's work to play for the St. Louis Cardinals for two months, I would giddily do it immediately. You know that old, completely wrong, by the way, adage that those who can't teach? Well, that's actually kind of what sports media is. We're only doing this because we can't play. Now, I'm not saying that all media people are jock sniffers or all frustrated failed athletes. I'm just saying that if you went to any press box in America and said, okay, would you like to stay the way you are right now? Or would you like me to give you the ability to hit a 100 mile an hour fastball 400 feet? Or dunk from the free throw line? Or throw a 60 yard spiral on a dime? Every single person in that press box would say yes immediately and they would be fools not to. To have otherworldly athletic skill is a genetic gift from the heavens. The rest of us are just hovering around those who actually have that gift, trying to make ourselves useful. The problem, of course, as David Cohn has learned, as well as Alex Rodriguez and Charles Barkley and Tony Romo have all also learned, is that eventually that otherworldly skill goes away. But you still have to make a living. So they all go into sports media, hoping to still be close to it, if not as close as they were when they actually got to play. Some people are really good at it. David Cohn is really good at it but he's only doing it because he's too old to actually play. And this is always worth remembering when you talk about sports. They are not like us. Or more accurately, they are like us, just like us actually, but only for a very short amount of time. Then they get old and they turn back into the poor slumps that make up the rest of the planet. We are normal humans describing these temporary superhumans. We can't understand. We can just try to stand nearby, but be as close as we can to it while we still can. Today's guest is a color commentator for the Yes Network and a five-time World Series champion, beating me by only five. He is the author of the new book, Full Count, The Education of a Pitcher with Jack Curry. Please welcome David Cohn. Sure. Thank you, Will. Thank you, by all means. Thank you for, uh, for uh, letting your presence give uh, this show the continued illusion of being a show. I guess my first question for you is, do other, do other athletes that are retired, because not every athlete, fair to say, that's a broadcaster, delves into that stuff as much as you do. Do they think you're a nerd, or do they just think that we're nerds for caring about that stuff? Uh, there's probably a happy medium in there somewhere. Okay, okay. I think there are. There's more. It seems like with each passing year, there's more, more uh, openness. Yeah especially amongst the retired players. There's, there's See, that's a generational what, divide, for sure. Well, because that's the thing. I think active players seem to like, I mean, I guess you embrace it or you lose your job, right? But retired players, I mean, I, I guess it seems like a difference in the job. Like when I hear you call, when I hear you be an analyst on a game, you're like talking about fan graphs and you refer to these things, as opposed to it feels like when I was growing up, most of the stories were about hot foot or like a gun or a practical jokes in the clubhouse. Do you think that's something that just like the audience demands more now? I kind of feel a responsibility to slowly educate okay. uh, the, the audience as well. And you know, that certainly you look at the baseball demographic. Right. You know, it, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. uh, it skews older and right. whiter, right. and right. Uh, so you, you you certainly understand who your audience is. But at the same point, you can still peel back some layers, and there's a beginning of an educational process, and uh, to help them understand that there's a new way to look at it. There's a new way to place value and give credit where credit's due other than just the traditional numbers. But it's funny because now, would you, if, if I'd have 
if so, all the fan graphs would have been around when you played. And I don't mean fan graphs like now where everybody knows fan graphs unless, I guess, except maybe Hawk Harrelson. Hawk Harrelson probably does not know fan graphs. But most people know fan graphs. But, like, let's say it's the early stages and all this information that we have now, the, we're beamed to 1989 and we're giving it to David Cohn. What would your reaction be? Would you have liked it? Would you say, get this away from me? Or, like, because I feel like a large part of being an athlete is just reacting, right? Or, like, like would you have not wanted the information back then? I'd have been uh, worried about the overload of the information, yeah. especially as you're preparing to go out and pitch a game. Right. And see, I have, I have so much emotions. Okay. You've got to manage your emotions. You've got to manage your, your mental well-being going out. You don't want to be overloaded. I'd want a good catcher. Joe Girardi was a good catcher. Right. He, I would want him to absorb that <laughs> right. information and kind of cover me. You can't bring the, 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 the <laughs> binder. It's yeah, a, he's sort of, got a wristband. Open yeah. it up. You know. Yeah. And yeah. I like the idea of like him catching the ball and opening up a binder and tossing yes. it back. But, uh, but no, I guess that's the thing, though, is like, do you think players now just have no choice? Like, because I feel like that, it seems like there's so much information. It's almost like being a quarterback in football, right? Like, it's not just a matter of, like, that guy's open, I'm going to throw it to him. There's, like, 80 things that you have to be in your mind all the time. It, it, it is, uh, do you think today's players just have to know that, or do you think they're still pushing it out? Well, you know, I think the younger generation has kind of grown up with this yeah. technology. They're much more receptive, much more open-minded towards it. You know, and I sort of break it down into two different things. There's a the sabermetric side. There's all the numbers, the fan graphs numbers, so to speak, baseball reference, uh, hitters' tendencies, yeah. counts. But there's also the analytic side, which is the stat cast, almost like the launch yeah. monitor right. Right. Of technology and spin rate. And that, to me, I would have been all over that. I yeah, that love seems that part of it. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, because the idea, like, would you – but I, I'm curious, I know, because, like, I, you would, when you would pitch, you would know that I, okay, I nailed that curveball. Like, that what I yes. got. Would it, uh, I guess that's the question. Would it feel, would it get in your head too much, though? If you're like, oh, actually, I thought that had this spin rate, but it actually was a little less. Would that have messed you up, or do you think it, it's just something you would have worked with? It's something I would have worked with in practice, certainly in the offseason, in between starts. I would have loved to have had the laptop right there, the high-speed cameras, and let me try this grip, right, right. and how does this come off? And now you're into spin axis, and not only spin rate, but the axis and the quality and the efficiency of the spin I would have been in just all <laughs> yeah, over the nerd yeah. out over yes. it. And, and everyone in the bullpen, would have, everyone on the team would have given you a wedgie for it. Apparently. Like, oh, look at, look at Cohn with his books. Yeah. No, I think they just do that to us. Um, <laughs> I look at, like, you look at the book and look at the teams that you were on. You were on some, some absolutely fascinating teams, and there's all these stories. There's stories in the book, and there's stories that have been written about some of the clubhouses and all the amazing things going on. It doesn't feel like, I don't know if the reporting's different, but it doesn't feel like there's been a while in baseball that there's been an... 86 Mets level type of clubhouse, right? Do you, like, do you think that's something specific to that time? Could you have something like that again? Like, I read stories in the book, and they're just they're crazy stories. I'm like, wow, these are these, these are all just characters all hanging out. But now it it doesn't it feels I don't know more efficient or like it feels like all the fun you were having or all the crazy dumb things you guys were doing now would be rather as inefficient and somehow a bad use of your time. Absolutely, and, un and unhealthy, too, right. for well, sure. Yo, that goes without saying. That doesn't mean it's not fun. Yes. It just means unhealthy. Yes, uh, the fun and health sometimes <laughs> don't go together, yes, right? Yes. Um, you know, I think part of the dynamic, too, for us back in the 80s was there was a much closer relationship with the beat writers who were covering us. Right. A lot of times we'd go out after the games together, <laughs> right, and, right. and we know that, that those stories would stay under their hats. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of writers that I was close with during that era that you just knew you could trust. Yeah. Unless something, if somebody got arrested, there's a threshold, you know. <laughs> if it becomes news, then they have to write it. But for the most part, you can get to know these, these people a lot better. You could have a couple of beers after the games with them. And they, uh, you, th there was a, a give and take that's just n it's not there anymore. So do you think it's just naturally confrontational or op the, like this just, everyone's just on the opposite side now? Or is it just, is that, do you think it's more of a media thing or do you think it's more of a player thing? Who, who's made that happen or has the player become more isolated? Has the media person become more weaker? Or just they just mutually not trust one another? Yeah, I think it's more on the player and the management side. You know, it's kind of how they train now. Everything's media training. Right, right. Uh, we didn't have media training <laughs> in the 80s. You know, the media training was a couple of beers after the game. That's <laughs> right. where you learn the media. Um, now it's, it's, it's you know, controlling the message is such a big thing I, I hear a lot, you know, with these media training sessions that they – they start at the minor league level all the way up. Through. I mean, you're still a personality. They probably, probably give them. To, you're, you're on a book tour. You probably, you've gone, you've probably gone through that yourself. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's. Um, I still kind of push back on that. The control the message part, and these people are not your friends. And uh, you know, watch out. Uh, don't get too close. Uh, 
I, I disagree with that. I think you can still be yourself, be personal, be honest, and uh, get to know some of the people that are covering the sport, and I think it would help a little bit. Do, so do you think that's actually one of the reasons that I, I, I sometimes push back on the idea that baseball is, like, I think there are certainly demographic issues that baseball has to result, but, like, there are more people watching baseball right now than any other time in human history. They're yes. in different places, and it's more regional, it's, but there are more people watching it ever. But it does seem, we did a segment for this show where I went to Times Square and just literally asked strangers, name me five active baseball players. And generally they could aim more dead baseball players than they could name active baseball players. Do you think that's something that was inevitable? Do you think it's something that baseball's done wrong? Or do you think that's just society is fragmented now? All of the above. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's a combination of everything. Now, do I think Major League Baseball and the Players Association uh, could get less adversarial and more on the marketing uh, front? Yeah, I think there could be a much better job of that. I mean, Mike Trout may be the greatest player, not only of his generation, maybe ever. Right. We may be watching the best player ever in the history of the game right now, and uh, I think he should be a household name. Now, part of that's the West Coast dynamic, and I, we're asleep on the East Coast right. when he's, you know, doing. And he's really thing. only seems to be into weather. That's like the only thing he seems to. <laughs> right. That's the big personality. Personality's right. part of it. So, uh, you know, it, it, there's something to be said for not only marketing the players, but players' personalities coming to the forefront. And I agree. I mean, if a player wants to hit a home run and flip his bat, yeah. I'm not going to drill him. Maybe back in 1985. I guess that's the question. You might have done that in '85, <laughs> yes. right? So, was, but would you say most analysts that often played in '85 or '90 or, or in that era? Is that why, because I watch the game now, and I think certainly young players are like, why is everybody so mad about this? And I feel like when someone throws at someone, I feel like they don't, they're not actually mad. They just feel like they're supposed to do it. Exactly right. And do you think that, but do you think that's just something that's going to get phased out? Do we need people uh, uh, older than you and less enlightened to you <laughs> than you uh, to, to die out? Like, how not die out, but retire out. Sure. To Hawk Harrelson out. Yes, uh, that's, that's part of it. That is, is it, part of it, you know, part of, part of the... The top end's just got to uh, got to turn over naturally, uh, but I I do believe that there's a lot of pitchers now who agree with with me that the punishment doesn't fit the crime. If Tim Anderson throws his bat, you know, towards the dugout after hitting a game-winning home run, that the you don't have to use the baseball as a weapon to drill him for that offense. It just doesn't match up. Uh, I mean, it's insane. Like, like yeah. we we both have seven-year-old seven-year-old uh, children. Yes. And like the idea, if my child, if my son, picked up an object. And out of anger or frustration or retaliation, just threw it at the like that's literally the like short of starting a fire. Right. That's the worst thing he can do. And yeah. so I'm not saying like what what about the kids, but like it seems like one of the most base immature things that can, that a human being can actually do. Well, he, but he, you know who's the police of this? Right. Oh wait, he smiled too broadly, <laughs> right. or wait, right. he, there's certain bat right. flips that are better than yeah. others. There's a I see. <laughs> I kind of like that. Tra you know, Trout uh, after right after the Tim Anderson thing, he hit a homer and he didn't do a Tim Anderson bat flip. But he did like a little bit because, you know, Trout's kind of yeah. the guy that they all kind of point to, our mantle, our, our upstanding kind of guy. And he gave like a little, just a little bit, of, not a, but just, I felt like a wink. It felt like a, okay, guys, yeah. let's all chill out. But this, maybe this goes back to your media idea that we talked about before. Maybe one of the reasons that none of these people are showing personality, like you can show personality because no one was going to talk about what happened after the fifth beer. No one cares about me anymore. <laughs> that's, yeah. well, that's, <laughs> that's not true. He's, look, his book is full count. You, you care about David Thanks for Cone. the save. That's what you call a Mariano save right there. <laughs> no, I just mean that, like, I mean, like, when you played then, you would know that, like, you could let your personality out, and there was probably not going to be a downside for you. Now, it feels like... Bryce Harper would seem to be a good example. Bryce Harper is someone who certainly has a big personality, but is also like a regular married dude that is like not like out partying all the time or getting in trouble, but he has this reputation as this outspoken rebellious guy because he seems to be one of the few baseball players that has an outward personality. Is that bad for the game, and is that because of the media thing that's going on now? That's a great point. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. I mean, I, I came from a little bit of a repressive culture. You know, don't show up the game, respect <laughs> right. the game. You know, if I strike a hitter out, keep your head down. But God forbid, look at the umpire wrong. You know, <laughs> right. you, you're right. going to get thrown out of the game or get the retaliation. So, yeah, there's got to be a happy medium there somewhere. I mean, genuine, authentic emotion is great. Great for the game. The kids want to see it. Uh, manufactured, what I call eyewash, you know, right. false, right. false hustle type right. emotion. Yeah, that that's inauthentic, and yeah, you can see right through that. And you know, that that's probably not going to work. But 
It, it, it's better than the repressive culture I came up in. Didn't feel natural no. to me to, to kind of hold it in. Wait, uh -huh. I did something really good. I want to. I want to. Yeah, I got to hold it in. You know. As someone that personally <laughs> rarely does anything good, I understand how exciting that must be. Um, I guess my, my last question on that too is, you know, you started out because uh, uh, there's famously you wrote a newspaper column uh, during a playoff series, and you wrote it like a newspaper columnist, probably better actually because it was interesting, <laughs> and uh, and said something that became bulletin board material and became like a big thing. Is there anything in this book that has gotten anyone that, who, who's angry about something? Is there bulletin board material in someone's, I guess now it would be their shed or their garage that they've, they've t they're taking from this book and that I can't believe Coney said that about me and they're going to, you're going to, they're, 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 they're going to retaliate at you. They're going to throw a ball at you just randomly <laughs> coming down the get street. drilled. I got to start ducking now. <laughs> Uh, no, not really. I, me, mostly. I bull, yeah. bullets and boarded myself, I think, uh, on there. I, it, it's, the thing we tried to do was just be refreshingly honest in the good, bad, and the ugly, the mistakes I made. I really wanted to show the vulnerability of a pitcher, the human side. And you know what? Sometimes we get crazy out there. I've lost my mind out there. I'm the guy that, you know, against the Braves, I argued with an umpire while two runners scored. You know, I completely yeah. lost my head That would out become there. a viral moment. <laughs> it's all top ten all-time bloopers. <laughs> I'll never live it down. I mean, that's the guy, the guy that uh, did stupid things off the field his first time in New York and got caught up in the party scene. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's refreshingly honest, I think, and that's probably the, the best part about the book in my mind. Um, okay, we have a section we call uh, dubious questions of, of uh, sorry, frivolous questions of dubious import. This is my 35th show and I get it wrong every <laughs> single time. Frivolous questions of dubious imports. Questions simply for you. Question number one, uh, I'm a writer. I type uh, fast into boxes. Uh, Roger Angel is one of my absolute writing heroes. Your last book, no offense to Jack Curry, who is awesome, but Roger Angel is Roger freaking yes, Angel. Yes. Can you give me, like, a, a just as someone that, like, I met Roger Angel in a press box one time and I really just had to be like, I really just kind of up to him, like, hi, you're Roger Angel. I'm Will. I just want to say I had this happen, and I, like, left. <laughs> like, uh, can you give me a good, awesome Roger Angel story of, of your time working on that book? Well, he, he told me a great one. I mean, Roger was fantastic. Uh, it was his book. Yeah. You know, I, was, I was just yeah. kind of the yeah. subject of the book. Um, there was a, you know, that was supposed to be, you know, kind of a, you know, at the tail end of my career. It was right after the perfect game. I was supposed to be on top of my game. I fell right on my face. So he had to switch, change lanes. And oh my God, this guy can't pitch anymore. It's terrible. <laughs> and now it's going to be immortalized. <laughs> my spin rate was way down <laughs> yeah. that yeah, year. Yeah, spin rate, yeah. Um, so Roger Angel and the great Bob Shepard, the, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, public address announcer for the Yankees at the stadium, uh, got to talking about this book, and uh, Bob Shepard looked at Roger Angel and said, forget the book. <laughs> and uh, Roger came to me and said, are you okay? Can we still do this book? And I, no, I'm gonna hang in there for you, Roger, because there were many times after another terrible game that I had that particular year where Roger would call me right after the game. He wanted it now, he wanted right. it fresh. I didn't call him back. I don't, I don't like <laughs> you right now. I, I, no, I, I don't you. want this in a book forever, <laughs> yes, what yes. I'm going through right now. You're, you're the great Roger Angel, but I'm not calling you back right now. <laughs> but he was very patient with it all. So, uh, you know, that, the Bob Shepard story still sticks with yeah. me to this day. That was a good Bob Shepard and Roger Angel impression, <laughs> by the way. Um, okay, so uh, I write for New York Magazine, and there's a 1999 profile of you by Chris Smith, still yeah. working at New York Magazine, in which there, this quote is about you uh, from Daryl Strawberry. Not many of the stories about Coney are G-rated. Now, <clears throat> what in the world, and maybe some of this is in the book, but what in the world could you do to get Daryl Strawberry <laughs> to say that stories about Coney are not G-rated? And I want every single detail of every single one. Uh, the stuff that you were, I don't want to put parameters on you, yeah. but the stuff that you were afraid to put in the book and too nervous that it would cause you trouble, Please tell me those stories. <laughs> I wish, I really <laughs> wish I had the guts to <laughs> tell the truth. I really do. I mean, that's part of the problem. I told the truth in this book <laughs> as much as I could. Um, Straw and I were really close. Uh, we became close. And a lot of those were just some knockdown barroom fights that we were actually in in the 80s that never got reported on. And with the, like, would you guys fight with like just people at the bar stool? Or? Yeah, well. You fight with each other. Not with each other, not with each other no. Um, I had his back. There was one particular time we were out in Manhattan at a place and uh, before social media, before cell phones, and uh, Strawberry was always a target. Daryl was larger than life, and people always wanted to take a shot at him. And uh, it happened one night. There was a, you know, a couple of guys right at the end of the bar, Strawberry and mouthing off, and one of the one of the guys' girlfriends wanted to talk to Daryl. You know, mm -hmm. obviously something involved there. So, next thing I know, Daryl's on the ground, 
Oh and uh, two guys are trying to pound him, and I came running from the other side of the bar, dove in the middle of the pile, knocked them off, just enough to, so Daryl could get up, and the two guys picked me up like a rag doll, <laughs> and they would have oh, broke no. me over their knee. Oh. The bouncers jumped in, threw me out on the street, and uh, I just gave Daryl enough time to regather yeah, himself good. and gave him a chance to defend himself, and then we were all out on the street looking back in at the bar, and the bouncers were laughing at us, and... <laughs> I had one of those old Coogly sweaters from the 80s. You know, oh, yeah. real ugly. The guy picked me up by my Coogly sweater, <laughs> threw me out on the street, and Straw said, you're my guy. Yeah. You saved me. You know? And from that point on, we were, we were like this. Well, that must be nice to be Daryl Strawberry to have David Cohn be your body. <laughs> yeah, That's I, really just, kind of I was more of a diversion. Yeah, yeah I know. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> Um, I, I will, so I have to say, some of the, those headlines that you dealt with back in the time, does it make you more sympathetic to like today's player? Or less sympathetic, and that like, like stories that come, like some of the stories that come out now. Is it, do you think it's harder for a current player to deal with stuff like that, or easier for a current player? Much tougher, Much in tougher. my mind. Um, I think that uh, there's a feeling that there's such a target nowadays with social media and one snap of a photo so quickly that a lot of times they go back to their hotel rooms and play Fortnite now. I mean, their video, their video, <laughs> yeah, they just hide, right? They, they hide. This is yeah. Adam Silver talked about this at the yeah. NBA about how like players are becoming lonely. Yes. Because they don't, they just don't go out because right. there's nothing but badness out there for them. I, I, absolutely, or you know, whatever it's social, you know, whatever, I mean, Tinder or we, right, you right. Know, you <laughs> swipe left. <laughs> right. I, I mean. Yeah, that's I'm, I'm confused about that as well. <laughs> but, you know, I it's uh, you know, let's let's play video games. What are we doing tonight? Yeah. You know, the '80s. Where are we going tonight? <laughs> yeah. Where of, are we, we not going? Yes, tonight. exactly. <clears throat> okay, uh, three more questions. Uh, I have a friend. I have a friend named Joe. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I want you to direct this to Joe. Because my friend Joe says that your perfect game should only kind of count because that Expos lineup was not a great lineup. So I was curious if Joe, and I'm not Joe, because I think Joe is a fool and an right. idiot and a monster and is smelly. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, what would you say to Joe if he were right here trying to make that argument? for? Because he has a sophisticated argument. Well, yes. he claims a sophisticated argument. Yeah. But uh, so uh, the experience of throwing a perfect game, to me, well, I would argue if it were against my, maybe if it against my seven-year-old, that, would, that right. wouldn't count. But like that's a major league baseball team. Uh, give, give, uh, give Joe the definitive, you're an idiot argument. Well, Joe, uh, <laughs> uh, hey, Joe, where are you going with that gun in your hand? Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> um, Vladimir Guerrero, a Hall of Famer, yeah. was in that lineup. Well, Jose, he was young. He, he was, was young. He was young, but he was in his prime. Yeah, he, he was, was dangerous. Right. Uh, Jose Vidro, all-star second baseman, was in that lineup. Rondell White, an established veteran in that lineup. Is there an at-bat in that game other than the last one that you remember the most? Uh, yeah, there's one in, uh, against Jose Vidro. He's a, he's a really good hitter. Uh, he's, I didn't run a three-ball count the whole game. Yeah, right. And three eighty-eight 88 pitches on Yogi Berra. Yeah, that's, and, the, that's uh, the best part about it. 2-0 to Jose Vidro. Uh, Chuck, Chuck Knobloch playing second base, who had the yips. Yep, of course. At that time. Hit Keith Overman's mom. Yes, <laughs> exactly. This was like a week before that. He <laughs> yeah. hit Keith Overman's mom in the head. and So smash up the middle, hard hit ball. Uh, you know, you talk about random variants and the luck factor mm -hmm. in the game. Well, this was luckily within reach. The knob black went over, backhanded it, wheeled and dealed, and threw a bullet strike right to first base. And we all, it was the loudest cheer of the day because the Yankee fans, you know, knew, right. we all knew what was going on. We were like, not anybody but Chuck right. at this point. Don't hit it to Chuck. They hit it to Chuck. Chuck wheeled and dealed and made a great throw, and that was Wow. At that point, you felt, felt like, this, this may happen. This is, this is my day. Yeah. I, I, I'm, as a Cardinals fan, I'm so baffled by this Luke Boyd situation. Yeah. And look, we liked Luke thank, Boyd. Thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, he's from St. Louis. Yes. Like, he's, he was a local kid. Everybody loved him. But, and he just always seemed like a 4A guy. He never right. quite got over it. So we went over there. We needed, like, hey, they're not happy with Shreve. We need a lefty. You, there's no place for you here. Right. Just go over there. And then he just turns in to, I mean, his numbers since he got there are better than judges Yes. <laughs> Judges yeah. and stands. I mean, absolutely. Uh, that it, it's. I can't just figure out though because it feels like we're supposed to be mad at the Yankees for that. It feels like like we're as non-Yankee okay. people. Damn Yankees. Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to be like, <laughs> oh, why did they get? It? But for some reason, he's likable. This Yankees yeah. team, I think Stanton unfairly sometimes is uh, people yeah. go after him. But like otherwise, I actually think this is this era of Yankees is kind of irritatingly likable. 
Yes, it's it's kind of gone through that that phase yeah. again. We had a little bit of that in the '90s with Derek Jeter yeah. at, at one point in the middle of that run. It was kind of it's hard to hate that right. team. Owned Paul O'Neill, Bernie Williams, <laughs> right, right. jazz but, musician, you know. Of course. So uh, yeah, it's kind of getting back to that again. It has that that certain feel to it. The the joy on Luke Voigt's face, oh, you know, when he with the, it's almost like he's surprised yeah. <laughs> from last year. He I never mean, looked that happy. In <laughs> yeah, he also didn't have of, the chains. Did yeah, you? exactly. He's got some <laughs> swag. We made him have that top button. Well, yes. the Yankees get some lax. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, my last question. I ask this of every uh, every guest, so uh, so so feel special, but also you know don't. Um, uh, are we? I look around the world and I see scary things everywhere around the world. Is is can be can feel particularly perilous at that, this particular moment in human history. Are we going to be okay? Do you think we're going to be all right? Are we going to make it through this tumultuous time and be okay? Yes, oh, absolutely. That is the most emphatic answer <laughs> I've gotten yet. And most people are like, absolutely. oh no, no, no. no uh, yes. yes. Oh, good, good. Okay, good. Things are better than ever. Oh. In a lot of respects. Okay, all right. Depends no. on what you compare it to. That's but. true. That's true. Yes. yes. No, no one has the plague. That is true. Yeah. No one has the plague. Um, okay, good. Yes. That was the best answer I've ever gotten. Thank you, David Cohn, for cheering me up and making me feel better. Uh, my my, my uh, payment for you for giving me that positive thing is to once again plug your book, Full Count, <laughs> The Education of a Pitcher, uh, with Jack Curry, who's awesome, by the way, as a fellow, yes. fellow sports writer. I don't mean to, to give Jack Curry a short thrift. He is awesome. Uh, David Cohn, thank you very much for coming my, on. My pleasure. Very well, much a pleasure. Yeah. The book is Full Count, Education picture of a Pitcher. A picture is a picture. You can learn about the picture and the pitcher. This is Full Count, and this has been The Will Lee Show. Please come back next week for, uh, on SA.com or Amazon channels or really wherever your Will Leeches are sold. David Cohn.